going to talk about a specific point that Andrew talked about, which is that we got rid of all the C code. Uh, it's not that we don't like C. I, it, I've probably written more C than any other language out there. But there are reasons to get rid of it. And it was also a really interesting process, that mostly what I want to talk about. So as Andrew said, as of the 1.5 release, the entire system is written in Go. There's also some assembler, but uh, not very much. The point is the C is gone. There's still C Go, but outside of that kind of thing, there's no C in the runtime or the tool chain. Um, now I'd like to just stress that I'm talking about the GC compiler now. GCC Go still still is written in C++ and uses the GC, uh, whatever the GCC library is. I forget the name of it now. Um, and um, that's still going strong. So it's not a general replacement, although I suspect the runtime work that we've done, a lot of it, which is in Go, will be bound up into GCC Go at some point. Um, so the first question is, why was it in C in the first place? This is a question a lot of language experts ask us, because it's well known that what you always do is you write your language in itself. Um, we didn't do that. Um, we didn't do it because we wanted an easy bootstrapping process. If you don't have a, if Go doesn't exist, it's very hard to run the Go compiler. Um, and so it's easier to take an existing language like C or for GCC Go, C++, write the compiler in that. Um, also, there's a subtle effect. If you write the language in terms of itself, the language becomes a language suited for writing compilers especially. And although that's an interesting thing, it wasn't really what we were after. So we didn't really care what the language was it was written in. But at some point, it became uh, harder for us to maintain the C language and the Go language side by side. We want to just move it to Go. Um, so why move the compiler? As I said, it's not for validating our work. Uh, we have very pragmatic motives, and they're simple. Go is easier to write than C. Go is easier to debug than C. Um, also, if there's only one language you have to know instead of two, it's easier to get contributions from the community. And that's already happening in, in much faster than it did when it was a C language compiler. Um, Go also has much better modularity. To say that C has any is a bit of an uh, <laughs> overstatement. Um, and of course, we've got the awesome tooling that comes with Go, which we can use to improve the compiler and work on it. There's actually unit tests for the compiler now. Imagine that. Um, <laughs> And also, uh, a point that is actually relevant is Go makes parallel execution trivial, so you can imagine running the compiler in parallel, and that's actually something that's sort of happening. Um, and so we're already seeing these benefits, even though that it's only really been working for a couple of months now. And there's a design doc called Go 1.3 Compiler, which uh, it was, the announcement was made around 1.3, although we knew it would be a few releases before it really got done. But it's not just the compiler that moved, the runtime moved too. Um, and so we had actually our own C compiler to run for just for writing the runtime for Go. Now, it wasn't a C compiler we wrote from scratch. It was essentially, although not exactly, the Plan 9C compiler. And we needed one because we needed our own ABI um, so that the, we could do things like have the segmented stacks work when Go called C for through the runtime and not have that break. So it was a very sort of subtle problem having two languages coexist. Having, owning both, uh, both compilers, the C compiler and the Go compiler running the same world made it a lot easier to manage it. So it was actually a really good idea for us to do this, but of course it, we had this weird extra C compiler that, that seemed strange. We couldn't use GCC to do that. Um, and so this process, really important part of this process, is converting the runtime to Go means we can delete an entire, an entire compiler from our tool chain. And that's a huge deal, right? Compiler, gone, nice. And of course, all the reasons I mentioned on the previous slide work for the runtime, too. You can have tests that work better and profiling and so on and so on. And so now there's only one language we have to maintain, which means there's only one set of stack management software we have to write. There's only one set of in, uh, data management and this kind of stuff. It's much, much simpler. And as usual, when I'm giving a talk, it's all about simplicity. Um, so there's a question that comes up, though, in this, which is why did we have our own tool chain at all? Why didn't we just build everything on top of something that was already out there? And that's a pretty good question. We even considered using LLVM for about 20 minutes in the early days, but decided it was just too slow. We wanted a fast compiler. Um, but we had our own reasons for having our own API, which invol are involved with things like how the stack gets laid out and how to do Go routine switching and this kind of stuff that's sort of integrated fundamentally into the, the, the some level of the compile world. Um, and so we just took what we were familiar with, which was the Plan 9 tool set, and not exactly, but to some extent brought it over and made it work. And so because we were familiar with that, we knew how to work on it, it's actually very small compared to like GCC or LLVM, we could move quickly with it. And that was, a, I think, as Russ once said, if we'd started with LLVM, we probably would have not gone very far. Um, not that there's anything wrong with LLVM, it just doesn't have our goals in mind. Um, 
There was last year uh, a rather rude uh, blog post complaining about our ABI, um, which uh, I won't go into in detail, but Russ wrote a very thoughtful response to it, which is worth reading because he explains these issues in great detail and I think did a really good job better than I can. Um, and so as a result of moving to Go, we can now do things that were not really possible. I mean, literally not possible before. Um, for instance, we completely re-architected re the linker. Um, we put in the new garbage collector that Andrew talked about and that Rick will talk about at length at GopherCon. Um, and that includes things like stack maps, which are a way to track what's live pointer data on the stack. Um, the new contiguous stack work. We used to do segments. We, when a stack grew, we'd allocate a new block and jump to that and then jump back when you returned. Now, if we hit the bottom of the stack, we actually allocate a whole new stack, copy the data over, which means you've got to update all the pointers and get all that right, and then run on that new world. And that's a pretty big change. And then the right barriers that are necessary to have a concurrent garbage collector. Those last three things are actually pretty close to impossible to do if there's C in your runtime. Because C is not type safe. You don't know whether a word is a pointer or not. It might be a union that's a pointer sometimes and a floating point number on Wednesday. You just don't know. Um, and there's also uh, lots of uh, aliasing that goes on due to optimizations in C programs because the compiler can recognize that this cell in this part of the function can have one type, but I can reuse the cell down here. And that kind of stuff is very difficult to follow. You can use stack maps to help you, although it's hard, hard, hard in C. But for instance, integrating that into the C compiler of any stripe is a very big deal. And now that we don't have a C compiler to worry about, that whole problem just death vanishes. So that's tremendous. And sort of proof of the pudding is we expect that GCC Go, which is written using a GCC backend, will probably have segmented stacks and imprecise stack data collection for you know, the foreseeable future, essentially. Maybe one day, but not anytime soon. So what about those stacks? Well, in 1.2 up to 1.2, stacks were these segmented things. Then in 1.3, that's the time we decided we wanted to make this move. We had to plan the new garbage collector, the new compiler move, and all this other stuff. And so the first thing we did was, was Keith uh, Randall suggested this making these contiguous stacks. But you can't do contiguous stacks with C code because you can't move the stack data because you don't know what's a pointer. So the first step was to implement contiguous stacks unless you're in C code. So when C code is running, you actually go back to segmented stacks. So basically in the runtime, sometimes you were in say, contiguous stacks, sometimes you weren't. Then in 1.4, we pushed harder on this and made the stacks contiguous by restricting where C could run to be only on the system stack. We literally jump stacks when you're going into C. So that was cleaner. And then for 1.5, well, you get rid of C code, the problem goes away, and now we always have contiguous stacks. And that's more efficient and just much better and also helps the garbage collector. Um, and also, independently of converting the compiler, we had to convert the runtime, which of course where the stack work happened. And that was mostly done by hand uh, with machine assistance. Um, and the tricky part is writing the runtime in a type safe language, which is pretty much impossible without breaking a rule. And the way you break the rule is you use essentially the unsafe package and maybe a couple other tricks. For instance, you have to, in the garbage collector, look at a pointer value as a bit pattern in order to be able to do things like set mark bits and that kind of thing. And so you have to use unsafe to do this. It turns out, though, um, there's much less of that than certainly I expected was necessary, which implies that we had the right kind of tool set for doing this kind of thing. Even though Go is type safe, we have a really good escape valve that's just kind of the right shape to make things possible to, to write a full runtime in this type safe language and only cheat when we really have to. Um, and also to convert the runtime, there's a lot of code to translate. Some of it was done automatically, which I'll talk about now. So the biggest job, the biggest single job in all of this probably was converting the compiler from C to Go. Now, you might think, well, why did you translate it? Why didn't you just write a new one? And that's a very good question, and it doesn't have a simple answer. Um, for instance, we could take the uh, Robert's um, Go AST and parser and so on, build that up, write a new backend or couple it to the backend. And there's, there's good reasons for doing that and good reasons for, for not doing that. But we decided to go with a strict translation for now at least, um, primarily for correctness. The C, C version of the Go compiler is a big program. It's actually about more than twice as big as the C version of the C compiler. Um, and it's got a lot of subtle things that we've tracked down, bugs we've fixed, semantic details we've worked on, and we know that those work. And if we can translate the code and produce an identical program in a different language, we just have a lot less to worry about. 
We're not going to introduce new subtle bugs in this process. And so we decided to translate it, but of course you don't want to translate it by hand. That's annoying. So naturally what we do, what we do it's sort of our full-time job, we wrote a program to write a program. Um, and so Russ wrote this custom translator that turns C into Go, and then you run that translated program to get the output. Uh, you run the compiler that results, which is now a Go program, but it's still a Go compiler. It should generate exactly the same output because it's the same program, just in a different language. If it doesn't generate the same program, you have a bug, you track down the bug, and you fix it. So you iterate until you have two versions of the compiler that generate exactly the same output. And then you know you have a correct Go compiler, even though it's machine generated. Um, and then the result, of course, is really bad code because it's machine translated. But then you can sit there using the awesome tools that we have to work on Go code to make it much, much nicer. And that's still going on even today. So the translator was done uh, uh, by uh, the tra generating this line by line translation. And I can't go into the full detail. Uh, Russ talked about it a little bit at GopherCon uh, last year, but it's actually turned into quite a different thing than what he talked about. It's, it's a little bit different. Um, I want to stress that this is not a general purpose C to Go translator. The, that job is just too hard. We had a very specific uh, program written in C in a certain style by a certain person, Ken, and we knew how to translate that dialect, basically. But the general dialect would, is beyond this tool. Um, so the first thing you do was uh, parse the C code. Uh, Russ had a Yak grammar in his back pocket, the kind of thing he carried around with him. Um, and we translated the C program into uh, you know, a parse tree. Go into it, fix anything that you can't represent inside Go. An example is star P++ uses an expression. Uh, in, in Go, star P++ is a statement. Um, and so you, you do what rewrites you have to. Um, now you have a C parse tree that's been simplified to Go, if you like. But it's still a C program. Now you print it as a Go program. So you just change the syntax when you print the tree. It's actually pretty easy to do, rel relatively speaking. Now you have a Go program that's a Go line by line translation of a C program into a Go program. Compile that and then do the cycle I talked about on the previous page. Now, the parser for the compiler is written in Yak, and that was actually hand tra translated using SAN to do most of the heavy lifting. Uh, so that wasn't run by the translator, but it's a relatively small piece of the thing and much simpler to do. So um, you, the translator sort of automatically can't do absolutely everything. It needs a little bit of help. Um, and so there's a sort of configuration thing that sits on the side of the translator that tells you things that it might not be able to intuit easily itself. Like this structure field is a bool even though it's declared as an int, because C doesn't have bools, at least old C doesn't. Um, or this function returns a bool. And then for more complicated things, like recognizing that this pattern is better done by calling on the standard library, um, there was a kind of diff-like syntax for generating these matches. And in this thing here, you can see this isn't C code because at this point you have a C tree represented in Go syntax. So this is what the tree looks like in, in, in Go code now. And you can replace this wretched stuff with a call to make or a couple of calls to make. Um, as another example of these kind of diff rules, this one um, C basically doesn't define what shift is. It's just, it's just very confused. Um, but in Go, they're very rigorously defined. And so you can take this fairly messy C program to make sure you get the right answer always, even when C doesn't tell you what's going to go on. You can replace it with a simple shift, because Go is better behaved in this respect. And so there's a bunch of these configuration things, which are typically generated by finding a bug in the output or a, or a bad piece of code. Um, once you have this working, you now have a Go program that looks like a C program that's been translated mechanically. And so now we can bring the tools of Go on to bear on fixing it up. And so Russ, again, wrote this tool called Grind. I don't know why it's called that, but it did a lot of grinding. I guess it ground the rough edges off. Um, and it now is in Go. So it can parse the Go program that results, do type checking on it, and then writes down a list of things it wants to change. Um, what it does not do is edit the parse tree, because it's kind of hard to edit parse trees. It's, it's annoying. It's a, it's a clumsy thing to do. What this thing does instead is, is represent everything as source text but parses it to see what to do, writes down a list of source edits, like on line 27, move this line down one, or something like that. And then when he prints it out, he executes that edit chain to generate new source code. So it's actually a source-to-source -source translator, by, but not by manipulating the, source, the, the, the parse tree. Um, and the changes that it executes 
are driven by various analyses and a lot of staring at the screen, things like removing dead code and unnecessary go-tos, um, getting rid of labels, indirections that don't need to be there and stuff like that. And then one I'll talk about quite a bit, uh, moving VAR declarations around, which turns out to be really important. So this was the big tool for fixing up the crappy code that came out of the translator. Now, what happened was the first time the translator generated a working compiler and we ran it on a real piece of code, it was using the HTML template test suite as the test case. It was 10 times slower than the previous compiler. Not because Go is intrinsically slower, but because the code was so terrible, right? But the question is, what's wrong with the code that comes out? And we actually learned quite a bit in, in understanding why it was so slow and speeding it up, most of which we've gotten back now. It's still a little slower, but it's, it's nothing like 10x. Um, the main thing is, is a combination of things that C does differently from Go. For instance, um, if you, in C, you tend to write really complicated for loop conditions. And Go doesn't do that very well. It's not intended to. And so what the translator would do is if there was a complex for condition, it would put it inside a closure, because that's the easiest way to get a single expression to be a complicated thing. And so all these for loops in the compiler were turned into closure runs on the iterators, which was really expensive relative to a regular for loop. So we, you know, by hand or mechanically, would rewrite those complex expressions to make the code more Go idiomatic. Um, a really important thing is that uh, on C, by definition, because it doesn't work, um, variables on the stack never escape to the heap. By definition, the stack is just the stack. There's no, there's no moving back and forth between them the way there is in Go. And so if there's a variable on the stack in the C version of the compiler, you know that that does not escape to the heap. But by the time it becomes a Go program, the Go compiler might not understand that. And so things get put on the heap that don't need to be because semantically it's too hard to figure out for the automatic translator. Um, and that caused some slowdown because things got moved to the heap that didn't have to. Um, there are interfaces that hide uh, some of this um, heap uh, escape possibility, like the way Stringer works versus the much cheaper VARs in C. Intrinsically, not intrinsically cheaper, but in practice can be cheaper. And then there's things like the lack of unions in Go. The C compiler is, has this massive union in it to save memory. And there are no unions in Go, so that became a struct, which made it bigger, which made it use more heap, which hurt the cache, and so on and so on. So it tried to squeeze some of those structures down to improve the density of the memory. And then probably the most important single thing is that variable declarations were in the wrong place. When you enter a C function, we're talking old C, C89, NCC, you always put the, all the declarations for the function right at the top. Opening brace, here, you know, int i, char star p, whatever. <laughs> Um, and in the compiler, uh, there were some very, very big functions, like the, the thing called walk that walks a tree repeatedly. And it starts with a massive block of declared variables. But on any given call to that function, only two or three of those variables might get used. But every time that function gets called, Go would say, oops, do escape analysis on this function and push all these variables out to the heap that didn't need to be, weren't even going to be used, let alone need to escape. And that was a major cause of, of GCC over, G, sorry, GC overhead, uh, bloat, and so on and so on. Um, and so one of the biggest things Grind did was turn that big block of declarations at the top of a C function now in Go and broke it down into moving the variables to where they're actually used so that the variables only get allocated and created when they're needed during execution, not every time every function is called. And that was a huge speed up doing that. Um, Another way to think about this is that uh, the C compiler uh, doesn't ever free anything to a, pretty much. It's not literally true, but it's pretty much true. It just allocates stuff because it's, it's got a finite run. It's going to be finished. doesn't have to maintain anything. And so it doesn't have any, basically no allocation and especially free overhead. Whereas the Go, there's a garbage collector. And it doesn't know that the compiler is going to complete. That's called the halting problem. And so it has to assume it needs to collect memory. And so the garbage collector provides a certain overhead here that is just unavoidable. But of course, we're working hard on making the compiler better. But anyway, this was a, a lot of interesting technical analysis about how C and Go are fundamentally different languages in a lot of surprising or not so surprising ways. Um, so we fixed a lot of these things pretty easily. Um, we moved variables closer to where they were first used. That had a huge effect. We'd also take a variable and make multiple versions of that variable through a function in order to allocate them only, you know, uniquely for each place. Um, we find places in the compiler where a library routine, which was optimized heavily, could be used instead of some generated Go code that wasn't very good. Um, somewhat related, but not exactly. We replaced the multi-precision 
arithmetic that was inside the compiler for doing expression evaluation for constants and replace that with uh, the math big package, which is a very efficient and correct, it turns out, implementation of, of <laughs> multi-position arithmetic. Um, we use some tricks to make the structure fields collapse. We sort of simulate unions using interfaces, which adds a certain computational overhead, but it's a win because it reduces the memory so much. Um, uh, David Chase, a new member of the team, has been doing much better escape analysis so that the difference between what the C compiler does and what the Go compiler does has shrank significantly. And then, of course, a lot of hand tuning and data layout and profiling and so on and so on. Um, and much of this was done by automatic tools like Grind, I mentioned, but also just GoFont minus R and the new tool, EG, that Alan Donovan wrote for doing a lot of this work. As, an, as a surprising example, while I was working on something I'll talk about in a minute, um, we, I wanted to fix up, uh, simplify some debugging prints inside the library that the compiler, the linker, and the assembler use. And to do this, I actually got rid of an interface in an argument and replaced it with a just made them just be methods. So it's a print method instead of a stringer, if you like. Um, and this is only used for debugging. It was never called in a typical compile. But when I made that change to a library, the compiler sped up 15%. And the reason is that because it might be called in debugging, the compiler's escape analysis decided it's going in an interface, we don't know what's going to do. This, all these variables have to go to the heap. And that was a fundamental data structure was escaping that didn't need to escape. So totally by accident, by fixing a print routine to simplify it, I made the compiler 15% faster because our escape analysis is, has got a ways to go yet. And there's tons more to do, and, and this work is ongoing. Um, so technical benefits of doing this, besides the one I mentioned, um, probably the single most important thing that's true now is that because there is no C code, no contributor in the community is going to submit a dangling pointer bug to the repository. <laughs> That's a huge win. Right? <laughs> um, but also, in doing this, it gave us a chance to clean up the back ends. We did a major refactoring, which I mentioned. I can talk about a little bit more in a minute. Um, one of the things that's really cool is we've now unified two of the architectures. So the 386, 32, and 64-bit architectures are now really just one inside the tool chain. So that just reduces the amount of code and complexity. That was kind of neat. It's now much easier to install a new architecture for a variety of reasons, uh, one of which is that you don't have to worry about the C compiler. Um, and we also, in the process, have now unified the tool chain. As, as Andrew mentioned, there's now only one compiler, one assembler, and one linker. So now when you want to compile, normally you just use go build, of course, but if you're not using go build, you're running it by hand, perhaps from make file. Um, you just say go tool compile, and you change the architecture and the operating system just with the standard goose and gorge, as they're officially pronounced. Um, and so you just normally would say go tool compile, go tool link, that kind of thing. So now there's only one compiler. It's a single binary. And that pro program's job is to compile Go program into the target architecture and target operating system as defined just by two environment variables, um, which is a little simpler than, I think, porting in some other systems I know. Um, and so 6G and 8G, they're gone. 5G, 9G, they're all gone. Uh, you just have one compiler now. And that, that compiler, at the end of this process, well, not the end, but where we are now, um, is about 50,000 lines of portable code. And then, um, but because of this refactoring that was made possible due to the Go tooling being available, we actually made a lot more of the code portable than used to be. So there's a lot of duplicated code in C that was very hard to unify, but in Go it was a lot easier. Um, so for instance, there's, although there's only one compiler and multiple architectures, there's only one registerizer. The registerization past the compiler is purely portable code that's controlled by simple configuration that's part of the architecture definition. So it's actually a kind of cool thing. Um, there's a little bit of non-portable code. It's typically uh, around 10% of the size of the portable part, so a few thousand lines. The uh, x86, of course, has got more than some of the others. But the, the tricky parts include things like people optimization and knowing things like this register gets written over if you do a shift and that kind of thing. But for the most part, like 90% of the code is now completely portable. And that also, of course, makes things much easier to work on. Uh, there's also a totally new assembler. Uh, just for fun, I wanted a project, so I decided to write an assembler. Uh, rather than, we have translate assemblers, which I again used as a reference when I was doing the work, but now there's just one assembler. It's entirely written in Go, um, and of course it's therefore a lot nicer code to start with. Uh, it's only about 4,000 lines, um, of which again less than, actually quite a bit less than in the compiler, relatively speaking, is machine dependent. And it's also, with a couple of minor twi tweaks, completely compatible with the old one. So it's, again, a complete 
you know, move to Go with the existing tool. What's interesting now is if you think about it, when you're looking at the compiler, the input language is the same, right? You always have, you know, func, printf, and all that stuff. The assembler is not a language you think of as a portable input language. But guess what? It is. And now, this is one of the things where the guy who blogged about me being a world-class jackass really missed the point. <laughs> the assembler syntax that Ken wrote, defined back in the plan nine days, it's all caps and looks like a 68,000 no matter what your architecture is. That seems annoying to people who love assembly language. But, that make, but the fact that it's actually a portable language means that you can do something like this have a single assembler in a few thousand lines of code for all the architectures in the world. And if you want to add a new architecture, it takes you very, very little time. And I'm going to tell you a little more about how we do that in a minute. Uh, and it's totally an, an, an accident of the kind of history that Ken is responsible for, which is having an idea really early on that 20 years later you go, that's what he was thinking. Okay. <laughs> um, and so there's also this unified backend logic, which is a, a single library with a single API for all of the architecture. So this, it was actually really fun to write this program and, and think about how different it was from the way people usually think about assembler. And then, of course, there's the same thing after the linker. Uh, there's now only one linker, no 6L, no 8L. Um, this was mostly done by using the translation tool and a lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat as before. Uh, it was actually the first part moved, I think. Um, and part of it was, was hived off into a, a library called internal slash obs, or just obs, which is basically the back end of the linker. And it does instruction selection, knows how to format instructions, generate object code, and all that kind of stuff. And if you look across all of the machinery now, there's about 27,000 lines of code there, which is fairly big, but it includes the definition of the instruction sets for all these machines. So it's quite a bit of stuff. Um, but now, this was related to my 15% my speed up in the compiler that I was responsible for. Um, there's now one printf. So anywhere in the, in the tool chain, you can print out a node or in, not a node in the compiler sense, but a, the linker sense. And it'll print out the instruction in a uh, standard, what we call portable assembler format, so it's human readable. And it's just one, one subroutine to do all that. So it's the kind of thing you get when you unify. It's really nice. Um, now, there's a bootstrap problem. There's no C compiler anymore, and I'm on a machine that doesn't have any uh, Go compiler. How do I boot? Well, the answer is go get a Go compiler. You know? Uh, just go download one. Um, that's the way to do it. Um, and so basically you need a 1.4 uh, compiler because the 1.5 port depends on a couple of features of 1.4. And we'll try, I think, to keep relatively close to that. So you grab the 1.4 build as a binary, just download it from the website, uh, put it in a go 1.4 directory, and then you can build from source the 1.5 and all the following guys on. It, it sounds a little onerous. It's actually not a big deal at all. You can read about how it works at the Go 1.5 bootstrap site. So uh, what's, what's the future? Well, there's still a lot of work to do, but we're pretty much frozen for 1.5. So we'd probably like to come by to be a little bit faster. It's still a little slower than it used to be, um, but we don't want to make big changes now. We're in the freeze. So it'll get faster later, but it's done now. It all works. Everything we've talked about today is real, um, but there's much more to do down the road. Um, for 1.6 and after. Uh, we're going to do better escape analysis, which has a huge effect on performance, uh, be better garbage collector stuff. Um, there's a new compiler backend using static single assignment that Keith Randall's working on that'll make it possible to do much better optimizations in the compiler, which have a huge effect, doing things like sub-expression elimination, eliminating index bound checks and that kind of thing. And this is the kind of thing that's, now that it's in Go, you go, oh, this is going to be easy now. Whereas in C, you probably wouldn't take it on nearly so lightly. So we expect the compiler generated code will improve markedly in the releases to come. The thing that I'm really looking forward to is we have a portable assembler um, and I don't want to write the tables for those assemblers. So Russ has a tool that he's been working on that will read a machine instruction set as a PDF and print out an assembler instruction set. Um, and it's, it's actually been used to write the disassemblers that are there now, but we haven't co coupled it to the front of the assembler. So the idea is that the manufacturer will either give you or your big borrow and steal the PDF or perhaps the XML. There's an argument that ARM might give us an XML. Description of their instruction set, we turn a crank and you get a new assembler for a new architecture. That'll be pretty nice. That's the way computing is supposed to work. So um, concluding, um, getting me to see was, sounds like a fairly small thing, but I think it's actually the, one of the biggest deals. The 1.5 is a huge release. With C gone, the new garbage collector, the new scheduler work, the Go Mobile stuff, this is actually a big, big numbered release. 
And so I think it's going to be one that will stand up to stand up. And, and it will have a lot of new things in there. But getting rid of code is actually one of the biggest things in it. Um, so we have code now all through the tool chain, all through the runtime. It's cleaner, test the, easier to test, easier to profile. It's just going to get cleaner and faster as time goes on. We have this new unified tool chain that reduces the size of the, of the binaries. You don't have you know, multiple linkers and assemblers hanging around. Um, and it's a lot easier to maintain now. Um, and so we have a much more flexible tool chain, a much more flexible source code. And so things are just going to get better as it goes on. But as always and from the beginning, portability is a key part of this. We want Go to be the most portable language out there. I think it already pretty much is. But we just want to make it more and more portable and easy to, to move around. Thank you. Who's next? You should come and swap here. I want to plug. So you use the phrase um, portable assembler a lot as you talk about the new linkers and assemblers. Uh, are there any updates that you feelings from the Go core team about using that as a compiled and yet appreciated independent portable thing that I might around? Uh, no. We haven't thought about that. Uh, maybe. Um, the assembler is not portable in the sense that you can take 3D6 assembler and run it on an ARM. But the syntax is portable, and that makes a lot of the work of the assembler much easier. I mean, you're still talking about different instruction sets. So it's not an intermediate representation like, like, the, like the IR and LLVM. It's still, this is 3D6 assembler, even though it looks like 68,000. But the instructions in it are 3D6 instructions, and this is the ARM assembler, and its instructions are ARM. It's just syntax is the same, and so most of the work of the assembler is in parsing. And so it's just a portable language in that sense. Uh, if you like, it's a portable language with different functions. Think of it that way. Yes? Is there a uh, plan to put the uh, compiler into a library so you might be able to JIT code? Uh, we haven't talked about that. It's, it's certainly something that's a lot easier to do now. Um, there's a lot of tricky issues, and I think we don't want to step in there while all this major linker work is going on to make C binaries call, callable from Go and vice versa, and that kind of thing. But down the road, it might happen. Um, it's not a small program. It's, it's not a, you know, it could be done, though, conceptually. Great. Well, I think we're up. Well, thank you.